morning, fam. Um, so the scripture reading today is um, from Acts 2, 42 to 47. And uh, it says, a generous and growing church, which I feel we are at the moment. So they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and dealt all things in common. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as any had need. Every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all people. Every day the Lord added to their number those uh, to the number those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, church. My name is Lisejo, and I have the privilege of serving this church as, as one of the elders and pastors. Um, this morning, I have the privilege of sharing the word of God with you. As a church, we're journeying in a series geared towards covenant commitment. What is covenant commitment? It is an opportunity to commit to the vision of Fellowship City and to participate in the ministry of the church in specific ways for the next 12 months. The vision of the church is seeing God's kingdom come by transformed lives in and through his transcultural church. That is a vision that we believe God has given to us, God has entrusted us, and God has sent us out into Centurion and the world at large with seeing God's kingdom come by transformed lives in and through his transcultural church. Covenant commitment is an invitation to participate, fam, to participate in the vision of Fellowship City and the ministry initiatives and the life of the church for the next 12 months. This is what we're asking people to commit to, these five things that you will see. Supporting the vision of Fellowship City, participating in the ministry, discipleship and fellowship spaces of Fellowship City, serving in the church through time and talents, giving treasures generously and consistently, and being accountable to the church family who are in this journey together. If you missed any of the series, if you missed any of the sermons in the series so far, feel free to catch them up on YouTube or your favorite audio podcast platform. This morning, we focus on point three of the five serving in the church using time and talents. Rain has already covered using talents. This week, we're going to look at time. Why speak about time? Is this a fundamental issue? What impact does your time have on your witness? What if I am too busy? I have an all-consuming job that requires me to work tricky hours at the drop of a hat. What if I have children that take up all my time? What if I'm holding down a job, kids studies, and I don't have time? All these scenarios are relevant as we ask what the importance of time is. All these scenarios speak to the real spaces we find ourselves in as a church. This morning, as we look at serving through the use of time, looking at Acts 2, which Leon read for us, and we're going to look at Romans 12, verses 1 to 2 as well, we hope to see what God has to say to us about the perspective we ought to have about our time. Four points, and we'll be out of here this morning. Overview of Romans, because it helps us to better understand what is to come. So an overview of Romans. Mercies of God as a second point. Lived out expression of the mercies of God. And time as a practical implication of that mercy. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we um, can gather as your people. That we can sing songs of praise and worship to you that you would be here amongst us by your spirit, that you would be moving, and that you speak, be speaking and touching our hearts as we sing, as we fellowship, and now as we sit under your word. I pray that as we spend some time now looking at your word, that you would speak to us through your spirit. We know that through the spirit you never condemn, but through your spirit you point us to the cross of Christ. Through your spirit, you correct us. Through your spirit, you encourage us. So I pray that this morning that we would not be 
anxious this morning, we would not feel that we're condemned, but that we would feel and know that the Spirit does not condemn and that the Spirit desires to build us up individually into the likeness of Christ and then corporately into the church of Christ. So if there is any feelings of condemn, I pray that we would remove those from our mind and focus only on the Spirit speaking and no other distractions around us. Would you be here with us this morning by your Spirit, Lord God? Would you speak to us those things that you'd want us to know, to say, and to do? And would the meditation of our hearts be pleasing to you, O oh Lord God? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our first point, overview of Romans. So Paul is the author of the letter Romans. The letter is written to Jews who are in Rome. The Jews were expelled by the emperor. Five years later, they return to Rome. And as they return, they engage with Gentile Christians, those who are not born as Jews. Um, they engage about traditional cultural practices that must be observed. Uh, the Gentiles, uh, Christians, push against these practices. Some of these practices are practices like uh, circumcision or what to eat and what not to eat. So the Gentiles push against these practices while the Jews who are now back in Rome want to observe and promote these practices. Paul writes this letter to bring unity between the Gentiles and Jewish Christians by sharing the gospel in four parts. As we look at Romans, there's four parts to the letter. Chapters 1 to 4 has the theme, the gospel reveals God's righteousness. This is a picture of the picture from the Bible project, and it shows those four themes. So the first theme is the gospel reveals God's righteousness. Chapters 5 to 8 has a theme, the gospel creates a new humanity. Chapters 9 to 11 has a theme, the gospel fulfills God's promises to Israel. And chapters 12 to 16, the gospel unifies the church. Chapter 12, which is the start of the last theme, starts with the words, therefore which is a conjunctive adverb, which joins what has come before and what is to come after. So the word therefore means if we continue with chapters 12 to 16 without understanding what has come before, without understanding the foundation, we may lose the essence of what is to come next. Paul says something happens in chapters 1 to 11, and because something happens in 1 to 11, then this life of unity of the church must happen. So the church can't be unified outside of what has happened before, which unifies the church. So what has come before? All the three themes, as I just mentioned, God's righteousness, a huge humanity, and God's fulfilled promises, all fit under this theme of theology. So Paul gives them a theology before he gives them the practical implications of that theology, or before he gives them the result of what that theology should produce. Paul is linking God's mercy through God's righteousness, through God's creation of a new humanity, and God's fulfilled promises being the reason for the church to be united and the reason for the individual to respond to the mercies of God in obedience, dedication, and worship. So let's look at these mercies of God. That's our second point. As though it was not enough for Paul to say, therefore, to link chapter 12 to 16, with what has come before, Paul uses another word, mercies of God, which also then links to what has come before. This shows the significance in how Paul is writing. That he's not only using a conjunctive adverb to link the two stories of this book, but he's also using other words that refer back to what has come before. Paul looks back at chapters 1 to 4. Clearly, there is a real motive for Paul to make sure the audience has the right theology before he speaks about the application. The use of the phrase, mercies of God, also creates the lens in which to understand the practical applications which will follow. And we will see some of those similar practical applications as we look at Romans 12, 1 to 2. So we can see the mercies of God in three ways through the overview of Romans. We'll see the Bible project picture now. The first way is God's mercy is evident in his plan to save man and declare them righteous. God's mercy is evident in his plan to save man and declare them righteous. In the Gospel Project snippet, we see the first theme that God is righteous, meaning right, particularly in a moral way. So God is the standard of being right. 
He always does what is right and fulfill, faithful to his promises. All nations have sinned. All nations are trapped in idolatry. This is both Jews and Gentiles. And we understand and see this particularly in this context. Jews believe that the obedience of practices sets them to be better than the Gentiles. But this isn't true. Paul says they know the Torah, they know the law, but they don't obey it. God's response is Jesus, who takes all the guilt of all the nations. Jesus takes the punishment to save us from the wrath of God in his death and resurrection to make us right with God. Those are the mercies of God seen through God saving us and making us righteous, putting on the righteousness of Jesus on us. The second way is God's mercy is personified in Jesus. God's plan to save all of humanity is in the person of Jesus who died a death that he didn't deserve for a people who deserve just punishment. The punishment for sin and facing the wrath of God in includes death and eternal separation from God because no one can obey the law. The Jews disobeyed the law even though they knew the law. The law only showed them how much they need a savior, a rescuer. The savior is Jesus. Jesus is the mercy of God. Jesus personified in his death, resurrection, and ultimate return is another way we see the mercy of God in saving us. The last way is God's mercy is evident in the life of the Christian through the Holy Spirit living in us and working out the purposes of God. So receiving the righteousness of God and having the Holy Spirit dwell in us enables us to be conformed to the likeness of Christ. The word dwell in the Greek is closer to the concept of living at home or being at home. So someone who is living at, at their home or own residence makes changes to suit them, to make it homely, so that they're comfortable. The Holy Spirit transforms us inside out, removing the clutter, removing the rot, removing what does not belong room by room, action by action, and putting what should belong as the Holy Spirit dwells in us. The Holy Spirit helps us to work out and live the purposes of God. Without the Holy Spirit, we can't live out the purposes of God. And that's the third way. God's mercy is evident in the life of the Christian through the Holy Spirit living in us and working out the purposes of God. So what is the purpose of God? That's a great question. So if we look at Romans 15 verses 8 to 9, it says, For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to conform the promises to the fathers and so that the Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy. The purpose of God is that we would glorify him for his mercy as a response to that mercy. The purpose of God sending Jesus as a personification of his mercy, the purposes of God, God's mercy in evidence, the Holy Spirit in us, the purposes of God saving man and declaring us righteous is all so that all nations would be amazed at his mercy and would glorify God. The reason we exist is to point to the mercy of God, to point to the cross of Christ. It's for people to be amazed, for people to, to say God is merciful as they see us. So two things need to happen for people to see and be amazed at the mercies of God. We need to receive that mercy and we need to live out that mercy. So let's look at the first one, received mercy. The mercy of God, as we have seen, is in God saving man. And God's mercy personified in Jesus and God's evidence of mercy in the Holy Spirit in us. Before the Holy Spirit lives in us, before knowing God as Lord and Savior, we are objects of wrath. We are destined to face judgment for our sins, rightfully so, like we saw in the overview of Romans. We are, we are sinners who reject God. We can't do any good. God doesn't see us in that state, and God then sends Jesus to cleanse us of all our sin. Romans 5, verse 6 to 8 says, For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person. Though for a good person, perhaps someone might even dare to die. But God proves his own love for us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We then take on the likeness of Christ. He does so by softening our hearts so that we can hear the good news of the gospel. We then respond by accepting Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We can't accept Jesus as Lord without God first enabling us to hear the good news. 
when Christ died for us, when we accept the grace and mercy of God, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us. This is a show of God's mercy, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us. This is how we receive the mercy, God making a way for us and us responding to our need for a Savior. The second thing that happens is a lived out expression of the mercy we have received. The lived out expression and receiving the mercy of God enables us to give glory to God. The received mercy and the lived out expression of the mercy. So what is the lived out expression of God's mercy in us? Romans 12 verse 1, we see Paul is urging us to do something. To present our bodies as a living sacrifice. In verse 2, Paul is saying we should be transformed by the renewing of the mind. So what is wrong with the mind? Why does it need to be transformed? What we know in our minds as truth becomes a conviction, and conviction in our hearts becomes actions. What we know in our minds as truth becomes conviction, and conviction in our hearts become actions. This is a picture of the best football club in the world. Some believe, <laughs> some believe and, and have conviction that Arsenal is the best club. But if they are transformed by the renewing of the mind, <laughs> if they see that Arsenal has not won a Champions League lately, then they will know that Chelsea is the best English club in the world. That is what transformation does. They will realize the truth. And that truth will seep into their hearts and there will be lived out expression of that truth. Having a truth in the mind forms a conviction like knowing that Chelsea is the best club in the world. So whenever I watch them, the conviction in the action comes from a sense of pride, from a sense of belief that they shall win as they continue to do so. When I see Manchester United or Liverpool fans, I feel sorry. Because I am convinced and have the conviction, but they may not yet have it. Um, this is a picture of a saxophone. The truth is it is the most beautiful instrument in the world. Uh, its beauty is in the look of the instrument. Its beauty is in the sound of the instrument. Yet, let me not say the beauty is in the price as well. But its beauty is in the look and the, and the sound of this instrument. Jake plays his guitar well but I'm convinced that the sound of a saxophone is a heavenly kind of sound. Um, just go to a jazz convention or concert or use your music player and be immersed in the sounds of Kirk Whalem, be immersed in the sounds of Jonathan Butler, uh, the sounds of Abdullah Ibrahim. And if you hear the sound of the saxophone, it feels like there's no other instruments. And that's when that conviction sets in and you turn to a jazz, uh, someone who enjoys some jazz. If there's anyone who can play the saxophone, that's a plug. You're welcome up here. <laughs> so we need a renewed mind. We need a, a renewed mind to, to correct our worldviews, to correct ungodly beliefs and perceptions, to correct convictions that are worldly, convictions that are from this age which we live by. There are no shortcuts to the renewing of the mind or a renewed mind. John 17 verse 17 says, Sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. There's no shortcut. Transformation of the mind comes when a Christian immerses and ex exposes themselves to God's word through faithfully studying God's word daily, individually, and corporately, through meeting with others and being encouraged and being built up. We need to be immersed in God's word so that his word can set us free from the things that hold us captive, from the ideas that hold us captive, from the idols that hold us captive. As we understand more of God's mercy, then his truth becomes a conviction in our hearts. His truth becomes a conviction that changes us. It becomes a conviction in our heart that enables us to live out the actions of that truth that we now believe. Romans 12 gives us an idea of how a renewed mind and a lived out expression that gives God glory looks like. So Paul doesn't just leave us in saying that we need to have a renewed mind or we need to use our bodies as a living sacrifice. He gives us an expression of how that looks like. How it looks like in loving others, looks like in serving others, looks like 
in being in community. The first one, if, if exhorting in exhortation, giving with generosity, leading with diligence, show mercy with cheerfulness. That is Romans 12 verse 8. Showing and doing acts of mercy and cheerfulness. This looks exactly like what's something that we see in Acts 2, verse 45. They sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as any had in need. Acts of mercy, acts of giving, acts of generosity. This is one of the lived out expressions of understanding this mercy and the action that comes from a transformed heart and mind. The second one is, let love be with, without hypocrisy. Detest evil, cling to what is good, love one another deeply as brothers and sisters. Take the lead in honoring one another. That's Romans 12 verse 9. Showing genuine love for one another. The only way to show genuine love for one another is through the renewing of the mind. It's through the Holy Spirit working in us. It's through being immersed by the word of God and transformed in the inside out. It's through understanding the mercy that God has given you, the mercy that God has given us, mercy that you have received, and that builds a conviction in us. The only way to love one another is not through shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder interaction, but it is through turning and facing one another to know one another. Something similar that we see in Acts 2, verse 42. Did they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. For verse 46, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with joyful and sincere hearts. This is face-to-face -face interaction from shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder interaction. This is being immersed in the word of God, which builds up a conviction in the heart and enables people to love one another, like we see in Acts 2. Another one is sharing with the saints in their needs and pursue hospitality. That's Romans 12, verse 13. So giving generous, generously, remember Acts 2, uh, verse 45. Acts 2, verse 46. They, they broke bread from house to house. A great picture of hospitality. Another one is bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. That's Romans 12, verse 14. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Romans 12, 17. Do not avenge yourself, Romans 12, 19. And do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil with good. All these are similar ideas, and that's why I've grouped them together. So do not curse. This comes with a renewed mind. It's countercultural. We bless, we pray for those who persecute us. We don't desire to harm others. We bring the hurt to God who will comfort us. We ask for forgiveness if we have hurt others. We seek reconciliation. If others have hurt you, you speak to them as well and share how something did hurt you. In all of this, we invite the Holy Spirit in to lead and guide us, to help us to discern and to use the right words to create a space for reconciliation. Because through reconciliation, God's mercy to us and us being merciful and loving to one another brings glory to God. Another one is rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, Romans 12 verse 15. So how will you know some are rejoicing and some are weeping? if you don't know people around you. Again, it speaks to community, to life on life, life in community, moving from shoulder to shoulder and to face to face. Acts 2 verse 44 has a similar idea. Now all believers were together and held all things in common. We have all things in common, which is the mercy of God, the mercy that will transform us by the power of the Holy Spirit living in us. We then will know to rejoice with those who rejoice and we will hurt with those who are hurting and show love and compassion, which all will bring the mercy of God in display and God will be glorified. Living in harmony with one another, do not be proud, instead associate with the humble. Romans 12 verse 16, living in harmony with one another, associating with others who might not have as much as we have, who might be in need, who are in different situations and circumstances. That again speaks to the mercy of God being real in us, convicting us and transforming us. And therefore the world will then see and glorify God because of his mercy. The last one, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink, for in doing so you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. So Romans 12 verse 20, show kindness, show mercy, show love, 
which all come from understanding the mercy of God in your life and the love of God on your life and a transformed mind. What you will see is that a lived out expression of mercy includes more than just giving treasure and talents. It also includes giving of your time. In Acts, they devoted themselves to teaching, to fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. They devoted themselves to meeting regularly in the temple, in homes. The apostle performed miracles and everyone was in awe of God and God's mercy. They spent time together and they served one another. They did life together. So in light of understanding the mercies of God, understanding the purpose, the purpose of God and him being glorified as the main purpose and understanding how we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, then how do we answer the very real questions about our time? What if I'm holding down two jobs? What if I'm a single parent? What if I'm a parent and holding down a job or working in very demanding type of job? What if I don't have time? Let's look at our fourth point, time as a practical implication. Time as a practical implication. So Professor Bruce shows at, works at a college in Canada as a professor of spiritual theology. He has this to say about not having time. Busyness is moral laziness because it is often a statement of our self-importance and our excuse to be inattentive to people. But God has given us just enough time to do what we need to do, moment by moment, to respond to him. And his grace is there. It is eternally present. Every moment is a sacrament where time touches eternity. And there's exactly enough time to do what God has called us to do. It would be easy for me to jump over the real challenges of the heart and mind when it comes to the reason why people often say they don't have time. I'm sure many of us sitting here would have heard that um, as a reason for people not being able to do something. Let's look at Luke 10. We see Jesus teaching as he walks into different towns. Jesus enters a village and is invited into the home by Martha. Martha is a sister. Verse 38 starts like this. While they were traveling, he entered a village and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who also sat at the Lord's feet and was listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks and she came up and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? So tell her to give me a, a hand. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. Let me repeat those last two verses. The Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and upset about many things, but one thing is necessary. Mary has made the right choice and it will not be taken away from her. The right choice is to sit at the Lord's feet and commune with the Lord rather than be occupied by many things. Martha may have felt the need to serve someone to prepare a meal. Martha may have been using the act of being busy as an opportunity to show how essential or needed she is. Sometimes our business is a way to show how essential or needed we are in different spaces, how important we are in spaces we choose. It is important to not use, it is important to use the word choose. So Martha chose to be busy in her serving. Don't get me wrong, serving isn't wrong in and of itself. However, the question Martha asks after shows something about what is in her mind and in her heart. Don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? The question we should be asking ourselves is, is our busyness because we choose to be essential, to be MVP in certain spaces, whether it be work, whether it be home? Here's another question. Do we use our busyness to avoid making harder, more costly choices? Costly at the expense of my comfort? Busyness can be an escape. Are we hiding away at the inconveniences time-consuming and unpredictable needs of others or the possible disruption it is to us. <coughs> Let's be real, sometimes our busyness is as a result of being stuck, maybe in a depressive moment. Marita, during a cellar, spoke about the reality of that and the need to get stuck back into community when you do feel stuck or depressed to seek help, to press into community so that the word of God and those around you can walk the journey with you so that you don't only see one set of footsteps and believe that God isn't there 
and that you continue in your stuck moment, as Ilana said, but that you see that as an expression of God being with you and the community being around you. So if we feel stuck, sometimes we feel stuck, maybe we're in a depressive moment, you need to seek help and you need to press into community. So let's tackle the all-consuming job. God calls us to work. In the workspace, we have opportunities to love others, to show the mercy of God. If we don't have those opportunities, then we might need to check our hearts if we truly understand the mercy of God in our lives, which should then compel us to show mercy to others. Is it enough if I'm only loving others at work? Or what if my work has me at the office on some Sundays? So an author, Dorothy Sayers, writes, what is the Christian understanding of work? It is that work is not primarily a thing one does to live, but the thing one lives to do. Or it should be the full expression of the worker's faculties, the medium in which he offers himself to God. Brothers and sisters, work is not your life. Christ is your life. Work is something we do as a part of life. Work is a part of obedience to God. Work is a space where we get to proclaim Christ crucified, but work is not our life. Christ is. Work should not disable us from living for God. If we look at Acts 2, verse 42 to 47, the people worked because there were some who had more than others. God blessed some, and some worked, and, and they devoted themselves to finding moments in which they would commune with others, they would be in relationship with others, moments to give monetary gifts, moments to give their time as an act of service and love. It wasn't a once-off missed Sunday opportunity. They tried to find moments regularly and daily and devoted themselves to the teaching, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayer. Daily they met. So there is grace where we're not able to come and meet with the saints. But we need to check our hearts that we don't have work as a priority. That work is not our life, but that Christ is. And that we find opportunities, not only on a Sunday, to meet and gather with the saints. For as we do that, as you give off your time, as you give off your money, as you belong to the community of saints, we give glory to God in that way. Giving of your time is as important as giving of your money. It's as important as the work you do for in serving, like we see in Acts 2. We build up the church. We build up the body of Christ. And the mercy of God is visible and God receives the glory. As a church, we believe that everyone plays. We create opportunities and spaces for everyone to use their gifts and give of their time. We spoke about some of, some of them last week in discipleship. Being in a discipleship space where you are giving off your time, where you are immersed in the word of God and transformed by the word of God through the work of the Holy Spirit. This week I want to share some of the ways in which you can serve in the church, in the body of Christ while giving of your time. We have a couple of Sunday-based ministries in which we need people to serve and give of their time. But let's watch some videos from people within our church who speak about serving and giving time. Good morning, family. My name is Asnat Mudipe, and I want to talk about serving at Fellowship City. I currently serve the church through my time by being involved in ministry activities such as prayer and hospitality. Serving these two departments has improved my own personal prayer life and to live obediently to the word of God, as the word instructed us to serve one another. I have time to serve as I make sure that I create time. I spend plus minus 30 minutes saving a church. Thank you. I hope this encourages you to serve also in the church. Good day. I am Rudolf. I am mainly responsible for showing the slides and recording the sermon videos and podcasts. I'm usually here about two hours before the service starts. During this time, I set up some audio and video equipment. And half an hour after the service, I pack these things away for next week. This is time well spent because we want to aid the worship experience and help the people to focus on the sermon. 
There are two reasons why I serve at church. A church is a community of believers run by a community of doers. Paul says in Galatians 6 2, carry one another's burdens. In this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Jesus says in John 13 35, by this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So by serving the, at church, I show my love to my fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And you can too. There are still opportunities to help during the service. For anyone who is interested, helping for five minutes can make a huge difference. Secondly, it is helping to produce the recordings for the social media platforms. This is a good way to share the gospel with people all over the world. So if you are touched by a sermon, share the video and podcast link, and it might change someone's life. Thank you, Rudolf. Uh, by this, all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. That's a part of serving. That's a part of giving our time. It's both serving and building up the body of Christ. And as you do that, you too will be built up, as we heard from Asnath. Serving and giving of your time enables the body to have all that it needs to develop and to grow. It enables others to be encouraged and to be built up. It enables more numbers to be added as we remember and see in Acts 2. Here are some of the spaces in which you can serve. Set up ministry. So the team is responsible for getting our space ready for a Sunday service and encounter worship spaces. They're responsible for packing away everything after the service is done. They're responsible for setting everything so that we can sit and enjoy moments of fellowship, moments of worship, and sit under God's word. Welcome ministry. The team is responsible for welcoming people to our Sunday services and encounter worship spaces. They're responsible for helping people to feel both seen and loved as they enter our space. Hospitality. The team is responsible for preparing heavenly coffee and tea for everyone to enjoy during our worship services. Yes, I said heavenly coffee. That is what it is called, and it uh, certainly tastes like that. This includes getting everything ready before the service and cleaning up and packing away after the service. This ministry enables a space for meeting and interacting with new and old people around the Java watering hole, mostly seen during the break uh, before question of the day. Sunday services ministry. The team is responsible for different transitions during our service. We have different roles Individuals who host this service, uh, like we had uh, Ilana championing our service this morning, giving us a lay of the land and helping us to know what we need to know, uh, or reading the teaching text like uh, Leon read and preparing our hearts to hear from God's word. The worship ministry, the team is responsible for serving through singing, playing instruments, still waiting for that saxophone or both. Um, this team practices during the week so that they are ready to lead the church into a place to meet and encounter God. <coughs> Production ministry, the team is responsible for running slides. You saw a video about that. Uh, let's, let's, uh, you can watch that video again on YouTube. The team is responsible for praying with and for people before, during, and after the service. This includes praying for the ministry of the church and praying for specific prayer requests when received. This team is also weekly praying for the needs of the church. Children's discipleship, the team is responsible for teaching our children. Our children are learning about the word of God and our children are growing in knowledge of who God is. And this happens during Sunday services and sometimes the team supervises the children um, when play time is, is set. So teen culture, this team is responsible for teaching our teens during Sunday services or helping with our teen culture Friday spaces, which include play, food, play, and setting up spaces for our teens. These are some of the spaces we have outside of our Sunday space. So those are the Sunday spaces. Sunday spaces. Now we have some outside of a normal Sunday space, which is the Young Adults Ministry. The team will be responsible for organizing Young Adults events, regular discipleship spaces, providing food and teaching. This ministry is starting in July. Uh, we've got Sonke, Women's Ministry. The team is responsible for organizing uh, events and communicating with our women in the church. There's the Sonke Women's Ministry, which we spoke about last week, responsible for discipleship. Men's ministry, the team is responsible for organizing men's events. Uh, one, of the, one of the big ones is our men's breakfast and communicating with our men in the church. The men's ministry is also a discipleship space, um, which we spoke about last week as well. So if you missed that, uh, feel free to catch that sermon on YouTube. As we close, our call and encouragement for people to use their time is because we desire to see the body of Christ grow. We desire to see people loving God and loving people. We have to have Jesus at the center of it all. 
not work, not our desire for comfort, not our desire to be seen as the MVP or essential individual within our busyness. We have to have Jesus at the center and we have to desire to see the body of Christ built up, desire to see God glorified. We have to appreciate and see and experience the mercy of God for us in order for us to live out that expression of mercy so that God is glorified. We believe through giving of your time, something happens in the life of the individual, as Athena shared, in the life of those who are in community as well. God, through his Holy Spirit, transforms you. God in the Holy Spirit transforms us. We desire to see the mercies of God as we believe we see these through our vision, seeing, seeing in people's life being transformed, seeing his transcultural church, people's life being transformed, the church of God growing, spotlighting the mercy of God. Another one is the mercies of God seen in discipleship, disciples being made. What that means, people are receiving his mercy and living out the expression of that mercy. Mercies of God are seen in Acts 2, verse 42 to 47, our main passage as we look at our covenant commitment series. We strive to, to, to be more like the community in Acts 2, the picture and the essence of church. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to a fellowship, the breaking of bread, prayer and they devoted themselves to meeting in the temple sharing what they have together and the lord added to their number daily this is impossible without understanding the mercies of god and the work of the holy spirit transforming us mercies of god seen in how we do life how we give of ourselves how we love god and love people mercies of god seen in how we serve and give of our time let's pray Lord, we know that by your spirit that you do not condemn us, but you encourage us and point us to the cross of Christ. This morning, as we look at the picture of Acts, as we see the early church, as we see how they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, the breaking of bread and to prayer, how they devoted themselves to meeting in the temple, how they continue to do life together, that you will transform them and we pray that will be the same for us. We pray that you would enable us to see and appreciate your mercy, your mercy seen in the death of Christ on the cross for us, your mercy seen in you, enabling us to receive that mercy and helping us to live out that mercy. Would you do a work in us where we don't live out that expression of mercy, would you grant us much grace and would you grant us much encouragement to live out that expression of mercy? Would Jesus be the center of it all? Not any other thing that desires to take our attention, but that Jesus would be the center of our lives, that Jesus would be the center of the church and that every knee would bow and everyone would see your mercy and you would be most glorified. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.